are aliens and the biblical end times connected with each other? Honestly, more than they want you to know. The topic of extraterrestrials typically surfaces thoughts of flying saucers, little green men, invasions, abductions, and much more. Over the past 121 years, Hollywood has been busy at work forming the minds of the masses through media. Little did we know, they are preparing the world to reject and fight against our Messiah when he returns. Seem far-fetched? Possibly. However, have you ever wondered how the beast is able to get the whole world to fight the Messiah? It's time to expose the dark agenda at hand and bring to light the truth. Shalom and welcome brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Parable of the Vineyard YouTube live stream. My name is Adam, your host, and I welcome you. Today is a little different topic than in aliens and the Bible. It sounds so far-fetched, but honestly, if you are a believer in the Most High, if you believe the Bible is true, you believe he sent his son, this is information that you really need to know. So I pray that this is a blessing to you and your family. Let's get right into it. So let's talk about aliens and the Bible, but more, more importantly, what is the agenda at hand? Uh, so everything we're going to cover today is an article form so that if I go too fast or if there's something you want to go back and cover or show someone or if someone's not interested in a video format and just wants to read it for themselves, well, here it is. And so today, aliens, right? What's going on here? The reason I'm bringing this up is because aliens has become so mainstream. I mean, almost every day there's like a new video coming out of these crazy lights in the sky and people are like, oh, UFOs and, you know, aliens are coming and all these different things. There's so many movies and TV shows about this that we really have to discuss this because I'm telling you, there is an agenda at hand and you as a believer need to know. So first, before we get started, let's talk about predictive programming. Before we begin, we need to make sure everyone is up to speed on this basic concept and tactic used by the enemy. Many of you are already informed of this type of warfare. However, just in case you are new, predictive programming is the method that the enemy likes to use to create its own version of prophecy and ultimately mind control. Because if they show you something like in television or media or whatever, and then it happens years later, they're like, ah, we told you. 9-11 is a perfect example. And so years leading up to September 11th, uh, 2001, there was all sorts of conditioning and, um, well, subliminal messaging. Uh, you know, like movies like Armageddon, you've got uh, the, the Twin Towers burning up, Super Mario Brothers in 1993, Iron Man in 1994, um, this movie here, The Squeeze in 1987. I mean, can, you can see how they're just desensitizing the public for what's going to happen. Uh, a comic book in 1963, Sesame Street, uh, the list goes on. Um, you can look at this stuff for yourself, uh, but you can just see this constant theme here of these two towers blowing up. Look at this in, in, uh, in 1994 uh, from this old cartoon here. Um, you, you've got people, you know, dressed like like Muslims or Arabic, you know, and with planes around the trade center, trade uh, center or um, the twin towers with a, a bomb. I mean, come on, seriously. So this is this is how. Satan and the media, they portray these things that are going to happen before they do. So they also conditioned the minds over the years for the previous crisis that we just went through, uh, this uh, agenda here, the, the COVID thing. Um, here, here's one of the many movies they did this through. This is probably like the most blatant one. This is a 2011 contagion. It's about a virus that starts in Hong Kong and plagues the whole world. And then the vaccine is, is of course the, the savior. So, um, you know, what do you do with that? And there's many other movies that are like this. Uh, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this. So hopefully a lot of you guys are already aware of this. If you're not, uh, then you need to look at this predictive programming. There's tons of YouTube videos out there exposing how this is done. This ties in exactly with what is going on with the alien agenda, alien agenda that I want to share with you all today. So this is how the enemy works. This is, this is how they, 
This is the vehicle they use. Mass media, news, television, movies, books, and even music have been shaping societal changes over the past few centuries. What you see and hear goes into your mind and becomes your own thoughts. Thoughts become words. Words become actions. It's This is how Satan like plants a seed. Like It's like what you see you ex- and you accept it. What you hear, you accept it. That's why it's very important to choose your music wisely and because you hear these songs and you repeat them. Well, you just might end up doing what you talk about so much. This is uh, Satan's arsenal to lead the world astray. After all, that's his job. How much time are you spending listening to him? TV, music, all these uh, different types of things here. So, through a barrage of media, movies, TV, books, false flag operations, etc., they're able to desensitize the public and prepare them for societal changes. So, real quick, this is kind of like, this is what was going on here. They're desensitizing the public from seeing the, the Twin Towers being destroyed. This is desensitizing. Um, so, when... Yeah, so when the enemy controls what the people believe, they're able to control the narrative as well, how the story goes. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. Before we begin, I do not endorse, nor do I encourage watching any Hollywood television or movies. And the reason I say that is because I'm going to be sharing with you a lot of these different movies over uh, the last uh, few, you know, couple decades as far as how they've been trying to shift the minds of belief in aliens and, of course, eventually the, um, the eventual arrival. Uh, in fact, I would recommend staying far away from them. If anyone is to watch anything, much discretion is required. Movies and TV shows have been the most effective way of brainwashing you. Only if you are fully grounded in your walk and faith would I even venture to watch, even for just investigative purposes. Regardless, the enemy is very crafty about wanting to gain a foothold in your life through your eyes and ears or any chink in the armor, so beware. So with all that being said, let's get into the alien agenda of what I really want to talk about today. So as a child of the 80s, uh, I recall the existence of aliens as just a work of fiction. Uh, You know, E.T., The Abyss, Cocoon, and an overflow of many others kept us entertained. Even through the early 90s, the concept of aliens being real was a fringe theory reserved for the X-Files fans. However, Over the past 20 years, through constant indoctrination, we have arrived at a time period where more people believe in aliens than the Elohim. That's the Hebrew word for God. So more people believe in aliens than the Elohim of the Bible. This is done by Pew Research Center. This is this is not a uh, some rinky-dink place. It says most Americans believe in intelligent life beyond Earth. Let's look at the the numbers here. Most Americans say intelligent life exists outside Earth, and so it says right here, sixty-five percent of people believe in alien life uh, outside of uh, this Earth. Here, thirty-four percent they say they do not, and two percent refuse to answer. But sixty-five percent is a majority. Now I'm going to be sharing a lot of screenshots of articles for you. You'll have a link for everything I'm sharing with you today right here. So again, if you want to come back to this article and you're like, well, I want to fact check fact check you or um, uh, or just go back and, and look at anything of this research, everything will be right here in this article form. And I'll leave a link for it in the description box below and in a pinned comment in the comment section. So uh, Gallup, a record low, 20% of Americans believe the Bible is literal, is a literal word of God, little word of, uh, literal word of Elohim. So like, right, it says right here, a record low, 20% of Americans now believe the Bible is the literal word of God. According to a survey from Gallup, that's down from 24% the last time this question was asked in 20, 2017 and half of what it was in 1980 and the 84 high point. So just uh, 40 years ago, um, 50% or almost 50% of people believe that the Bible is a little literal word of God and now only 20% do. So obviously that's declining. And then, uh, uh you know, uh, it's amazing. So you have this, this huge increase in people believing that, um, 
aliens exist. And if you look at like the the different uh, scales, uh, different uh, poles from like the 50s to now, it's just growing, 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 growing. And of course, the belief in the Most High or Elohim is decreasing. Here's a couple more articles, uh, and, and I would encourage you to kind of do your own research because I just took a few clippings. Um, it says here, this is from Yahoo News. This is not some uh, this is not some uh, rinky dink uh, news organization. It says Pope Francis says he would definitely baptize aliens if they asked him to. So aliens is just becoming pop culture and just very acceptable. Like it, this is a reality. Uh, this was just uh, pulled the day of, of uh, putting this together. Uh, and, and it says this is from MSN. An algorithm has detected eight mysterious signals that possibly came from aliens. Uh, so they're just, they're just instilling in the minds of the existence of aliens. Uh, it says here, Keanu Reeves wants to be the first to talk to aliens when they invade. And that's a strong word, invade. And that's that's kind of the theme you're going to see today. Well, there's there's some um, movies about nice aliens and those kind of things. The general theme is that aliens are going to come and invade and attack. Uh, Daily Mail, what could aliens look like? Forget little green men. Life on distant exoplanets may resemble humans, experts say. So this is, it's just, if you if you just like type in aliens and, and click the news tab on whatever search, I mean, you'll see. I mean, every day it's flooding um, the media. I hear Yahoo News again. Uh, Joey Votto predicts alien invasion after MLB uh, asks for bold predictions. And this was just a couple days ago. Uh, and so this is becoming so mainstream about an alien uh, invasion. Um, Newsweek, if aliens visited Earth, first contact probably wouldn't be UFO balloons. So the whole uh, aliens and UFO thing, uh, of course, got reunited, uh, reignited, excuse me, with this whole, you know, China balloon thing or what's really going on. Uh, it's just stirring these conversations and so um, here, at MSN survival guide for alien invasion. I mean, this is a major news network that's putting this stuff out. And it says here, America has a plan. Without giving further details, the retired colonel of the U.S. Army, uh, Manuel Superviel, uh, assured CNN in 2019 that there is a contingency plan for that case for an alien invasion. And so, let me ask you a question: When people keep reading about this over and over and over again, what do you think people are eventually going to believe? That number one, aliens exist, and that there's an invasion coming. But if you stick with us, I'll show you that there's a a a, a purposeful agenda uh, against the Elohim of the Bible, the Most High, and His Son that He sent. There are so many more articles we could spend days covering them. I'm seriously, I'm not exaggerating. Um, there's, I, I mean, I probably could have easily just put another hundred articles here of different things of them pushing this alien, just pushing it on the people constantly. So perhaps you already get the point. So we'll, we'll kind of stop there with articles. My question to you is why would Hollywood and other media outlets expend so much effort to form this belief? And that's the question we're going to answer today. Here's a, a recent film from Netflix. A father has a recurring dream of losing his family. His nightmare turns into reality when the planet is invaded by an alien force bent on destruction. That's the reoccurring theme you're going to see is, again, aliens from somewhere else are going to come into and invade our space and, 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 and attack and, of course, attempt to take it over. But let me tell you this, brothers and sisters, and this is why it's important to believers. There is a kingdom coming that is not of this earth. And when it does, it will be treated as an enemy alien force. Remember the words of our Messiah? He says, my kingdom is not of this world. So if it's another world, but it's eventually going to come here, what does that mean? And that was from John 18, 36. And I saw heaven opened. What do you think that's going to look like when heaven opens? And behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of Elohim. This is, our, this is the Son of the Most High. This is our Savior, our King. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, listen, that with it he should smite the nations. So when, he, when he's coming, he's coming with vengeance. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath and the wrath of El Shaddai. That's the Almighty. 
And he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Master of Masters. Revelation 19, 11 through 16. So this is the coming of our Messiah. What do you think that's going to look like when the heavens open? It's probably going to look like some sort of threat. He came first as a suffering servant, but will return as the conquering king. Now listen to this. This is a couple of verses later. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth. The beast is the ruling power in the end days. The, and it says very specifically that the beast gets its power from the dragon, Satan. So it says, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gather together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army, Revelation 19, 19. So war is coming. And on that, this isn't just, you know, not just nation against nation, but the kings of the earth against Messiah and his kingdom. That's the war that's coming. Think about it for a second. Ask yourself this question. Did you ever wonder how the devil would be able to trick the whole world into fighting against Messiah? Think about it for a second. How does he accomplish that? What will be on the minds of the people? And I believe that's what's going to play into this agenda. Wouldn't people just instantly recognize his second coming? And they'd be, oh, that's Messiah. Perhaps the masses will be blinded, much like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the others were at his first advent. So when he first came, they couldn't see that he was the Messiah, even though he did all these wonderful works and healed people and did all these great things. They, they couldn't see it. They were blinded, you know, of course, spiritually. But what about the people of the earth? How will they just not see like, oh, this is, you know, this is the son, of, this is the son of the most high coming back. Satan, of course, would have to somehow control the narrative. This, I believe, is the alien agenda. And as we saw, as we mentioned earlier, when something goes down, the the news outlets, the governments are going to want to control the narrative. So if they keep pumping this alien invasion thing, when something, when Messiah does come down, with his kingdom and with fierceness and with wrath, what do you think the, the, the governments are going to do? The news outlets are going to do? They're going to say, oh, look, that's the enemy. Don't believe me yet? Please stay with me. And I'm going uh, to show you with scripture. So this, I, I believe, is the alien agenda. We spent quite a bit of time digging into the subject last year. If you have not seen it after this video, I would highly recommend it. This is the coming war I'm mentioning right now. And, of course, you are the enemy. Messiah and his people are the real enemy. Here's a passage from 2nd Ezra, also known as 4th Ezra, which was included in the 1611 KJV. So those of you that are afraid of reading anything outside of the Bible, I'm going to show you real quick what we're getting ready to read was from the 1611 KJV. This is kind of revered as one of the most uh, important uh, canons out there. So this is the book, uh, the original book names uh, from the books that were included in the 1611. So I'm going to kind of scroll through here. You'll see that these are the books that we're all used to. Um, and then you'll see here, Right here-ish, right here, um, is the book of Second Ezra. This was included. Uh, it was it was in the Apocrypha section. Apocrypha means uh, hidden. Uh, and so, anyways, the book of Second Ezra was uh, part of the Bible. So this was considered canon and scripture until the late 1800s. They took it out of your Bibles in the late 1800s, when it was taken out during the dispensational movement. Ironically, it is books like this that expose the coming deception. I believe our Heavenly Father allowed this to happen to bring about the end times. So some people are like, oh, are you saying, you know, the, the Most High can't keep his Bible together? That's, that's actually not the case at all. I think he allowed men to do certain things to allow these end times to come to pass. But the good news is he's bringing these, bo these books back to his people to attain knowledge. So this is from the book of Second Ezra that I'm mentioning. After this, I looked, and behold, an innumerable multitude of men were gathered together from the four winds of heaven to make war against the man who came up out of the sea. And I looked, and behold, he carved out for himself a great mountain and flew upon it. And I tried to see the region or place from which the mountain was carved, but I could not. After this, I looked, and behold, listen to this, all who had gathered together against him to wage war with him were much afraid, yet dared to fight. That was 2 Ezra 13, 5 through 8. So some people might take offense, because this is talking about Messiah and the world coming against Messiah. Some people might take offense with the passage that states coming up from the sea, because Revelation 13 says something similar. But listen, it says, I said, O sovereign master, explain to me, why did I see the man, who is Messiah, coming up from the heart of the sea? He said to me, just as no one can explore or know what is in the depths of the sea, 
so no one on earth can see my son or those who are with him except in the time of his day. 2 Ezra 13, 51 through 52. Satan's task is to get the world to oppose and fight our Messiah when he comes. Can you agree with me that that's one of his jobs? The scriptures tell us he will be successful. He will unite the world under one banner, one religion, and a united cause, which probably sounds really good on the surface for people like, oh, you know, we're stronger together and we should be united. One of the main reasons I'm making this video is to make sure you don't end up on the wrong side of this war. I want to share with you an interesting little, quick little clip of Ronald Reagan, honestly driving home the point I'm trying to make right now with his own words. Listen, listen to this. I couldn't help at one point in my discussions with, privately with General Secretary Gorbachev, when you stop to think that we're all God's children, wherever we may live in the world, I couldn't help but say to him, just think how easy his task and mine might be in these meetings that we held if suddenly there was a threat to this world from some other species from another planet uh, outside in the universe. We'd forget all the little local differences that we have between our countries and we would find out once and for all that we really are all human beings here on this earth together. Well, I don't suppose we can wait for some alien race to come down and threaten us, but I think that between us we can bring about that realization. In our obsession with antagonisms of the moment, we often forget how much unites all the members of humanity. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. And yet, I ask you, is not an alien force already among us? What could be more alien to the universal aspirations of our peoples than war and the threat of war? I think maybe I'd answer it this way. I, I keep in my frustration sometimes you know, actually, if you count some of the things going on in smaller countries and all, there have been about 114 wars since World War II. There's there's one more. I apologize about that volume difference from the first video to the second. Uh, anyways, he, he repeats himself three times in three different settings. And this is exactly the point I'm trying to make, is that this is what Satan and the kings of the world, the governments, are already, they're already aware of what, what's going on. They're preparing the world to see this outside alien threat put down all the wars that we have with each other and unite as one to unite against this common enemy as they say who he will be. I'm here to tell you that that enemy is going to be Messiah. Is That's who they're going to portray to be the enemy. Uh, so let's keep going. There's a lot more evidence that I would like to share with you. So um, believe it or not, I'm sorry to be repetitive, believe it or not, Messiah and his kingdom will be that threat, this alien threat, this outside threat that Reagan's talking about. This is also the reason for these wars that are taking place. Since the late 1800s, they have been planning this moment. Problem, reaction, solution. It is interesting that this is also the time when these books, uh, like two Esdras, that talk about these things were removed in the late 1800s. Because Satan knows how this will play out, they need war and the emotional reaction to be able to unite as one people. That's the problem, reaction, solution. So problem is war. The reaction is people don't like war and people dying and their relatives dying. And the, re the solution, of course, is to unite as one, to unite against this common enemy. enemy. And the catalyst is going to be, uh, I, I believe, the coming of Messiah. So they're going to need the emotional reaction to be able to unite as one people. Meanwhile, inverting who the enemy actually is. In this case, the targeted enemy will be Messiah and his kingdom. Think about it. How on earth could the whole world reject him at his coming or his second coming unless they were conditioned for centuries to do so? This we'll talk more about Independence Day. Independence Day, I believe, is the, like the um, the prototype, like the, 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 the perfect example of what they're going to try to push. Right? There's the enemy. Get him. So let me ask you a question, serious question. What happens when real angels become visible? Because when we look at like art, they just look like people. And I know aliens can appear like people, but there's different classes of aliens that have a very different description of being human. Uh, like the Ophanim, which is the this what you see right here, the rings and the seraphim. They're all covered with eyes. Now, uh, let's just uh, show this real quick. 
you know, uh, is this exactly what they're going to look like? Maybe not, but this is kind of how the Bible describes, describes them, like full of eyes. And, you know, my question to you is if, my question to you is this, when these angels come down, you know, are, are, are people going to be like, oh, hey, mom, dad, look, it, it's the seraphim. Oh, it's the ophanim. Oh, it's the, it's the cherubim, you know? Um, no, they're probably going to be like, look at those aliens. Look at those, you know, creatures. I'm not going to, you know, call them creepy or anything because I'm not going to, I don't know exactly what they look like and I'm not going to talk bad about, you know, the most highest creation, but you know, just, just a sincere question. So like, like right here, while these representations may not be exact, at least they follow the scriptures that describe them. So what's going to be the reaction when people see these angels that are very different from life here on this, on this earth? It should be a sincere question we ask ourselves. But here, let's get to what the scriptures say to Ezra about how you're going to see here that the narrative is that War and we see, you know, we know Messiah says that the birthing pains will be wars and rumors of wars and famines and pestilences. So all these things have to come to pass first. And so what we're going to see here is they're going to they're going to perpetrate war, like world war, and in the midst of it, they're going to see this common enemy and they're going to be like, hey, let's stop fighting each other, let's unite and fight them, which is really the common theme behind a lot of movies. Again, Independence Day, the first one, that is like the playbook. You have the you have the the mothership coming down and, and and all these different things are attacking different cities and everyone's like hey you know why don't we start working together and defeat this enemy and that's what they do and so they're conditioning the minds to be like hey if you work together you can defeat this enemy that's far superior to you behold the days are coming when the most high will deliver those who are on the earth and bewilderment of mind that people are going to go literally insane shall come over those who dwell on the earth and they shall plan to make war against one another city against city, place against place, people against people, and kingdom against kingdom. And when these things come to pass, the signs occur, which I showed you before, then my son will be revealed, whom you saw as a man coming up from the sea. And when all the nations hear his voice, listen to this, every man shall leave his own land and the warfare that they have against one another. And an innumerable multitude shall be gathered together, as you saw, desiring to come and conquer him. Did you just see that? This is what it literally says, that people are going to be fighting each other, and then they're going to see him, they're going to stop fighting each other, and they're going to be united in one cause, which is what? To desire to come and conquer him. But he, Messiah, will stand on top of Mount Zion, I believe this is New Jerusalem, the kingdom coming down, and Zion will come and be made manifest to all people, prepared and built, as you saw the mountain carved without hands. So this mountain that's carved without hands is his kingdom. And he, my son, will reprove the assembled nations for their ungodliness. This was symbolized by the storm and will reproach them to their face with their evil thoughts and the torments with which they are to be tortured, which were symbolized by the flames and will destroy them without effort by the Torah, which is called the law, which was symbolized by the fire. Second Ezra 13, 29 through 38. So this is the reason for the alien agenda. Our Messiah will be coming down from heaven with his city and kingdom, New Jerusalem, and Satan will gather the world to attempt to make war with him. Sound familiar? Every alien invasion movie. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, Listen to this, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken and they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. So while his appearing is going to be magnificent and joyful and uh, a great time for his people that love him, that that have accepted the Most High Son uh, as the, the Lamb of, of Elohim that came and offered his life for us, and those that are truly walking in faith and obedience to his ways, that's going to be a joyful moment. But those that find themselves on the wrong side of these things, they're gonna their hearts are going to fail them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. Because their fears are going to come true. All these, all these Hollywood movies and people are going to be afraid and literally uh, terrified for their lives. And as we know, when a body of people are fearful, they are much easier to control 
just like we saw with the whole, uh, you know, uh, pandemic thing, pandemic thing. People were easy to control. They literally just gave up their rights and they just, they're like, yeah, well, I, I, I want my, uh, I want my freedom. I want my, you know, whatever I'll, I'll give you, I'll give up my rights. You know, how much more for people are afraid of their lives being annihilated by an alien force. They'll do whatever is told them. That was Luke 21, 25 through 27. Here's back to MSN. Survival guide for an alien invasion. Right here it says, every, listen, it says every country versus the aliens. It would be logical in the face of an extraterrestrial threat for all nations to unite. This was stated by Gorbachev and Reagan, respective leaders of the United States and, then the, so and the then Soviet Union in 1985 during a summit in Geneva. Did you see that? This is the agenda. This is how they form the minds. When things begin to happen and panic breaks out, the world leaders will have the solution already ready for you. Here it is again. This is just a different slide from that same, um, that same article. It says, Meltdown and the Cordial Anti-Alien Alliance. Gorbachev revealed the conversation in a 2009 interview. Ronald Reagan asked him, What would you do if the United States was suddenly attacked by someone from outer space? Would you help us? The, the then leader of the USSR replied, Without a doubt. We got you. So is this starting to make sense yet? So they want to unite the world as one people. This is why they're spending so much effort using these stars, these celebrities, right, to push this global citizen thing that we're all just one people. Here's their hand. Here's their calling sign, right? We're not going to get into this today, but some of you already know. These hand signs unite them under the same satanic banner. They want to unite as one, and they will use any means necessary. And here's the sustainable goals. I'm not going to go over all these, but uh, this, once again, is problem, reaction, solution. The, the issue is they actually, the, the people in charge, create the problems. Then they form the, uh, the reaction, the, 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 the reaction of the people through media. And, all that, and then they ha just so happen to have the solution. So uh, it's like poverty. Who wants poverty, right? Uh, who wants hunger? Uh, everybody wants good health and well-being for each other. All these things sound great, right? but it's going to come at a cost. Pope Francis unites all religions over sustainable development. That's what this is, the sustainable development goals. And that's what's going to happen. All religions are going to unite. All people are going to unite as one people. And on the surface, to some of you that may be like, well, what's wrong with that? Like, what, what, why would you not want all people to be you know, one people? We're called to be a light to the nations. Yah is people. Yah is the, the Father, the Most High, Yahuwah. That's how I understand his name. You know, we are called to be a light to the nations, his people, which means we should not hate those who do not be, believe like this. So, so we shouldn't be like hating on Muslims or uh, Buddhists or anything. We, we shouldn't hate them. Messiah says we're supposed to even love our enemies. So even if you look at those people as enemies, we're supposed to love them. That's if you're a follower of Messiah. We are to be kind, gentle, long-suffering, helpful, loving, and ready to share the good news of Messiah and how we follow him in faith and obedience. Yet, the scriptures also tell us not to be yoked or to become one with them. That's where the separation believes. And so that's is where, again, this is some of the things I really want to share with you believers out there of the agenda at hand, the, the, way, the direction the world is going, and the direction his people need to be going, which is not in step with them. The world, anybody ever seen the Pied Piper where he just, you know, plays the thing and all the kids just kind of just leave, you know, leave the cities with him? We're not supposed to follow the Pied Piper is the point. So here's, here's some scripture. Do not be yoked with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and lawlessness share together? Or what does light have in common with darkness? Or what harmony does Messiah have with Belial? That's Satan. Or what does a believer share with an unbeliever? Or what agreement does the temple of Elohim, again, the Hebrew word for God, what agreement does the temple of Elohim have with idols? For we are the temple of the living Elohim, just as Elohim said, I will dwell among them and walk among them, and I will be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. And listen, therefore come out from their midst and be separate, says 
Yahweh. This is um, this is the Tetragrammaton Yod Hey Vav Hey, uh, which again I understand our Father's name to be Yahuwah. Some say Yahuwah, uh, some say Yehovah. There's different pronunciations, but we just understand his the Father's name is to be Yahuwah. So Yahuwah says, "Come out from their midst and be separate." So we're not supposed to be uh, like this. We're not supposed to be uh, this global citizen. We are citizens of heaven. That's our uh, that's our nationality. That's who we are. That was 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 17. So while we're still in the world, we're living beings in this world. We're not to be of the world or like them. We need to tread carefully and not to follow the footsteps of the agenda that can be very enticing at times and deceptive. Because, you know, there'll be there'll be hunger and poverty and all these different things. And they'll be like, well, if we unite as one, we'll solve all these things. But again, Yah's people are not called to be one with the world. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? And Yahusha, this is how we understand the Hebrew name of our Savior, or Messiah. And Yahusha answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Messiah, and shall deceive many. Matthew 24, 3-5. So it says here, Come out of her, my people, Revelation 18.4 I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you will not participate in her sins and receive any of her plagues. That was Revelation 18.4 So we're supposed to come out of her. We're not supposed to be the same. Hollywood and the circle. Yeah, that's this typical flying saucer thing. Why would Hollywood pick a flying circle or a disc to appear from space? perhaps to show a superior technology that surpasses our understanding of flight and aerodynamics. Or maybe there's more to the story. Nevertheless, most alien movies portray something circular coming to Earth to take it over by force, something our Messiah will lawfully do. Let's take a peek. So these are just some screen clippings of some of the movies out there. And we'll read later that when he comes, he's going to come with fire. It's always this you know, circular thing. I think this is maybe Prometheus. I can't remember what movie this was. Here's an interesting one. This is the movie Armageddon. You see this rock coming to destroy Earth. There's a rock coming to smite the nations. We'll read about that in a little bit in Daniel 2. I'll tell you that Messiah and his kingdom is that rock. And so that's how they portray it. This threat, this outside threat, this rock is coming to shatter the nation. So again, here's Armageddon, and just you just constantly see this circular thing. After discovering that an asteroid the size of Texas is going to impact Earth in less than a month, NASA recruits a misfit team of deep core drillers to save the planet. So what's interesting, it's interesting they mentioned Texas because um, uh, I mentioned this, I think, in uh, last year. I actually did this video last year, but I, I wasn't fully happy with it. There's a lot of changes I wanted to make, so uh, here a year later I'm redoing it and... and, and um, fixing some of the things I wanted to fix. But what's interesting is when you look at the size of uh, New Jerusalem, uh, it's roughly the size of two, te two, two Texases. Two Texas. How, what's the plural of Texas? Texi? Anyways. So anyways, um, this asteroid is coming to destroy the Earth. NASA recruits a misfit team of deep core drillers to save the planet. So there's always this outside threat and humans come together uh, to save the planet. Uh, this is the movie Arrival. Again, just kind of just sharing with you that there's this common theme of this this circular thing that has to do with these outside threats. Uh, of course, this is the Marvel Avenger series. You see this uh, just circular thing all the time. Uh, this is, by the way, this is Thanos right here. Thanos sounds like Theos, which is the Greek word for Elohim or God, you know, the guy that has ultimate power, time travel, invincibility, doesn't need food or water, wants to take over the world, gathers his stones, which his people are also called his stones, his precious stones in the Bible, wants to destroy half the population and sit on a throne. This is who they portray our Heavenly Father to be, and they portray him to be some this maniac. Avengers 2012, Earth's mightiest heroes must come together here it's like, must come together and learn to fight as a team if they're going to stop the mischievous Loki and his alien army from enslaving humanity. You know, Loki that comes from this uh, other world, a beautiful golden kingdom place. This is obviously a stab at our Messiah and his kingdom coming. 
Another one of Satan's main objective, objectives over the past few generations has been to turn what is good in our Heavenly Father's eyes to be perceived as evil. So what Yah calls good, the devil wants people to perceive as, oh, that's bad. And this is an interesting passage from Isaiah 520. We're going to break down. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. So people that invert it. That put darkness for light and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. It's a heavy weight to consider that even Christians, most Christians, believe that our Father's commandments, His law or His Torah, is a burden or enslaving or just for a certain group of people when in fact it's been given for His people for all eternity. So I'll show you here that the Torah and the Scriptures is good. It says here, For I give you good doctrine, forsake you not my Torah or my law. Proverbs 4 2. Listen, this is from Paul. Wherefore the Torah or the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and just and good. So the Torah equals good. The Torah also equals light. It says, For the commandment is a lamp, and the Torah, the law, is light. The Torah is also sweet. The law of Yahuwah is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of Yahuwah is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of Yahuwah are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of Yahuwah is clean, enlightening the eyes. The fear of Yahuwah is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of Yahuwah are true and righteous altogether. Listen, more to be desired are they, talking about his, his law in general, Yes, than much fine gold. And listen, sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. So his Torah is good, his Torah is light, and his Torah is sweet. So once again, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Isaiah 5.20. So even in the modern believing Christian world, the law is really not adhered to because it's been taught that it's been done away with. These are just more of the deceptions that Satan has infiltrated the faith with. Let me ask you a question. Speaking of the law, you ever wonder why Satan is called the lawless one? Here's uh, Guardians of the Galaxy 2014. A group of intergalactic criminals must pull together to stop a fanatical warrior with plans to purge the universe. That's exactly what Messiah is coming to do. He's coming to purge. Avengers Infinity War 2018, the Avengers and their allies must be willing to sacrifice an all-in attempt to defeat the powerful Thanos before his blitz of devastation and ruin puts an end to the universe. Listen, Messiah is coming with his kingdom and he's going to bring a lot of devastation. That's his right. The Battle of Los Angeles, a squad of U.S. Marines becomes the last line of defense against a global invasion of aliens. This is Battleship. A fleet of ships is forced to do battle with an armada of unknown origins in order to discover and thwart their destructive goals. But as we continue to see, this is always this circular ship. This circular thing is always the theme here. This is um, uh, the Close Encounters of the Third Kind where this city, this circular city comes down, right? The circular city. I think this is um, Deep Impact. We're going to talk about Deep Impact in a second. Star Wars, the Death Star. It has a throne room known as the Planet Killer. Scattered resistance joins together to destroy the threat. This is the common thing. And they make the, you know, of course, the bad guys, uh, They, you'll see they liken them to our Heavenly Father. So the Emperor Palpatine. There's lots of quotes that really take a stab at our Heavenly Father and the Messiah. Everything that has transpired has done so according to my design. That's, that, those are similar words to what our Heavenly Father says. So what they're doing is they're twisting our Father's words and they're making our Heavenly Father look like the enemy. And that's how they do that through these movies. Heaven and earth are about to collide. This is that Deep Impact movie. This is, once again, this is about a rock coming from outer space, as they say. That's a whole other topic. Uh, coming to come and destroy the earth. That's exactly what Messiah is. Messiah is that rock and his kingdom are coming to shatter the nations. A comet, a comet discovered uh, to be on a collision course with Earth. As doomsday, doomsday nears, the human race prepares for the worst. So it says heaven and Earth will about, are about to collide. And that's actually exactly what's going to happen in the future. Heaven and Earth will collide. That's what scriptures say. 
And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So there's war in heaven. Satan's cast out. And it says this, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now! Is come salvation. So when Satan's thrown out, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our Elohim and the power of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our Elohim day and night. Revelation 12, 7 through 10. So what this is saying is when the devil and his angels are thrown out, the kingdom comes down at the same time. So literally, the heavens open up, uh, the, the you know, heaven basically comes down to earth, heaven and earth will collide. And that's what's going to happen. And you're going to have two kingdoms here on the earth. You're going to have the beast or Satan in his kingdom and the Messiah in his kingdom. And they're going to clash. Here's another picture of that rock coming to destroy the earth. For they drank that spirit of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Messiah. 1 Corinthians uh, 10, 4. Messiah is that rock. The kingdom is that rock cut without hands. Here we still see this in Daniel 2. This is a, just to give you some context, this is all about, this is about Daniel in Babylon interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream because Elohim gave him the interpretation to save his life and all the other people's lives. And uh, Daniel was interpreting it and he basically showed Nebuchadnezzar um, the time of his kingdom all the way to the end, about how four major kingdoms would rule the earth. Him, him of course, with Babylon, then Medo-Persia, then the Greek Empire, and then the Roman kingdom, which uh, ruled from a couple, you know, couple hundred years before Messiah. And it says in, in Daniel that it will rule all the way until the time of the end. And in the days of these kings shall the Elohim of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. Listen, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. For as much as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, we read that earlier in two Esdras, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, and the silver, and the gold, that's all the nations. The great Elohim has made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. So these movies portray Messiah coming to shatter the nations. But of course, they come up with these plans, in some cases plans to you know, destroy these big rocks coming or the, the alien invasion coming. But the, the general census is to get people to be, just be um, uh, aware of the situation that an outside threat is coming to destroy this earth. And they want people to fight against Messiah. That's the alien agenda. I'll show you some more. Here's Elysium. You just continue to see this circular thing that is the threat. And that's the threat in this movie is uh, these people living, um, you know, these people that are best essentially above uh, these people living in this um, circular thingy in space. And so the people ended up hating these people and, and you know, mocking them. And of course, they formed a plan to go and take it over or destroy it. That's the same theme we keep seeing. And there was given unto him, this is the beast, a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against Elohim to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Revelation 13, 5 through 6. I'm here to tell you that this tabernacle and heaven is Messiah's kingdom. I'll show you right now. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from Elohim out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of Elohim is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and Elohim shall, himself shall be with them and be their people. I'm here to tell you right here, brothers and sisters, that the tabernacle of Elohim is New Jerusalem. New Jerusalem is the kingdom. And it says here the, the beast will be able to blaspheme his name, and his tabernacle. So he's literally going to be blasting this kingdom, whatever it looks like when it comes down, this big city, this big, whatever it comes out now to be out of the sky. The beast and his kingdom are going to blaspheme that tabernacle and the people that dwell in heaven. So uh, I know that a lot of people uh, believe that the the city, the, the, the kingdom comes down uh, after the thousand year reign and after everything is done and over with. But um, 
that's a whole other story. I'd like to share that with you. I think in our Revelation line by line series, when we went over Revelation 21, uh, if you're interested in, in looking at that, um, be more than happy to. Uh, if you if you want to research that, um, I think there'll be a lot of evidence to show you that uh, it actually comes at the beginning with Messiah. Messiah comes with his reward. He comes with his kingdom. Right? He's going to rule from his kingdom if his kingdom is not of this world. Where is it? It's I believe it's within the walls of New Jerusalem. So will Messiah's kingdom hover in the sky for some time? Maybe. And that's why they keep portraying things like this. But just constantly in media, you see this circular thing. Right here it says, For behold, Yahuwah will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. Isaiah 66, 15. What would it look like? And you see, like it's like this again. This is Independence Day. You see it just coming with flame. You see this outside threat coming with flames of fire. So they're socially conditioning or mentally conditioning the people to when they see something like this, they're going to be like, oh, "Aliens! We gotta, we gotta get them." So this is uh, Independence Day, the movie on July second. Communication systems worldwide are sent into chaos by a strange atmospheric interference. It is soon learned by the military that a number of enormous objects are on a collision course with Earth. At first thought to be meteors, they are later revealed to be gigantic spacecraft piloted by a mysterious alien species. After attempts to communicate with aliens go nowhere, David Levinson, an ex-scientist turned cable technician, discovers that the aliens are going to attack major points around the globe in less than a day. On July 3rd, the aliens all but obliterate New York, Los Angeles, and Washington, as well as Paris, London, Houston, and Moscow. The survivors set out in convoys towards Area 51, a strange government testing ground where it is rumored the military has a captured alien spacecraft of their own. Listen to this. The survivors devise a plan to fight back against the enslaving aliens, and July 4th becomes the day of humanity, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, you see in the movie, you see all the nations start sharing information and come together, and they learn to fight together against this far superior enemy with far superior technology. And so Satan is just conditioning the minds, but see, you can do this. You can fight against him, and I'm going to help you. And that's the alien agenda. It is. And again, just in, in this movie and many others, you see this circular city thing coming out of the sky. And he that overcomes and keeps my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and the ve as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. Revelation 2, 26-27. So Messiah and his people are going to reign over the nations. So even for the survivors, they will want to incite rebellion against the Messiah's new order. And I'm talking about the NWO. That's not Messiah. But he is going to bring a new order with him, is he not? So just the same circular thing. Here you see this devastation. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And Yahweh shall utter his voice before his army for his camp is very great. For he is strong that executes his word. For the day of Yahweh is great and very terrible and who can abide it? It's going to be a pretty rough day for a lot of people. That was Joel 2, 10 through 11. Here you just continue to see this like circular city thing that's just destroying and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before Elohim to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Revelation 16, 19. So when he comes, he's going to bring des devastation. And the, the and Satan has conditioned the minds of the people to like hate Yah for this, to hate Messiah for this. But this is how the story goes. This is their, this is their earth. They created it. And they created the laws to be obeyed. And people hate him. People hate the Most High. They hate His Son. They hate His laws, His commandments, His Torah. And so because of this, He's going to bring destruction. Just like He did with the flood. Just like He did to Sodom and Gomorrah. And just like He will in the last days. And if you hate Him for that, hey, that's your right. That is your right. I'm assuming if you're still watching this video, you're, you're probably still a believer. But um, that's His right. And, you know, He's given us the choice, which is amazing, the choice to serve him or not. So again, just continuing to show you this circular thing. Uh, this is very important, this circular, why Hollywood continues to portray this circular spaceship city thing coming out of the air is very important. Look at this. They're, they're bringing in people, right? Strange lights descend 
on the city of Los Angeles drawing people outside like moths to a flame where an extraterrestrial force threatens to swallow the entire human population off the face of the earth. Let me ask you a question. You ever wonder if the alien alien movies have it backwards on purpose? And I'm, I'm thinking about this. You think of that passage uh, that uh, Paul talks about in First Thessalonians 4, that when he comes, Messiah is going to raise the dead first, and also those who are alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds. Is it possible that you know, um, he could bring up his people up into the kingdom, New Jerusalem, and it'll look something like this, where people are like, "Oh my gosh, they, you know, they're they're taking these people away, and uh, oh, they're killing them." When in fact, that could be what you want to happen to you. Just, just a, just a thought. It says, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall knock ever light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. Why? Because they're afraid. They're like, oh no, what is that? Look, they're sucking up all the people. No, this is exactly what we've been seeing in all those movies. And they shall see the sign, I'm sorry, they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power in great glory, like we read earlier uh, in Revelation 12, when, case, when, when Satan is cast down literally to this earth, it says, now has come the, the kingdom and his power. So he's coming with the clouds of heaven and with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of the trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heaven to the other. Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Could this be look like with the gathering? I mean, obviously it's not going to look like this. I'm just saying, are they trying to like flip invert this that when this happens people are like oh no but in fact you know this might actually be like oh yes just a thought the fear of yahweh is the beginning of knowledge but fools despise wisdom and instruction proverbs 1 7 have you cracked open the book of proverbs yet it's a good book alien invasion right always just fearful Always making our father and his kingdom look like wild beasts. Here's an interesting one. Again, just that circle, circle. The Tomorrow War. Remember that video I shared with you earlier? Uh, it says, um, what was the name of that mo movie? Uh, the Coming War, You Are the Enemy. Check this out. Especially for you Sabbath keepers out there. Listen to this, t The Tomorrow War. You know, uh, the movie where the evil aliens work six days and rest on the seventh. Uh, yeah, that's right. The aliens have a Sabbath day in this movie. What are they prepping the world for? I mean, come on. Speaking of the Sabbath, I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also, the sons of the stranger that join themselves to Yahuwah to serve him and to love the name of Yahuwah, to be his servants, everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and takes hold of my covenant. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Isaiah 56, 5 through 7. If you're like, oh, the Sabbath day is for the Jews, it's done away with, oh, please stay with us, because that's an even bigger an agenda that has, has happened. The fifth wave. Again, you just see this circular city thing destroying people. The movie where aliens take over the world and destroy it in multiple waves. Seals, trumpets, vials, maybe. There's that movie signs, but again, you just continue to see this circle agenda, which we'll talk about. For if we uh, if we will sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for judgment, and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. This is that day of judgment that's coming. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Now listen, Messiah came to raise the bar of how much sore punishment suppose ye uh, shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the son of Elohim and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and has done despite unto the spirit of grace. For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongs unto me. I will recompense. I will repay, says Yahuwah. And again, Yahuwah shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living Elohim. And that's why I've made this video. I do not want anyone watching this to be on the wrong side of things when it goes down. So just knowing about the alien agenda is, is important, but there's so much more. And I hope you stay with us. Hebrews 10, 26 through 31. Anybody ever played this game? It, all this stuff is even in video games. Super Soldier, John 117, which if you look up this verse, it's about the law. Master Chief of the United Nations Space Command must battle a genocidal alien race known as the Covenant. 
Come on. Following his violent crash landing on Halo in an ancient and mysterious ring world. The Covenant is ran by the prophets. The prophet of truth being one of them. Now, speaking of which, it says, uh, Master Chief of the United Nations Space Command. It is interesting now that the United States ha now has Space Force. I mean, like, why? Really? But, so it's talking about a genocidal alien race known as the Covenant. The Covenant is ran by prophets. The prophet of truth being one of them. This is the prophet of truth in this video game. This is a quote. Pilate therefore said unto him, Are you a king then? Yahushua, again, how I understand the Messiah's name, answered, You said that I am a king. To this end was I born. And for this cause I came into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. John eighteen thirty seven. So uh, Messiah is the prophet of truth. And so they're mocking our Messiah. And I'll show you. The prophet of truth. Soon the great journey shall begin. But when it does, the weight of your heresy will stay at your feet and you shall be left behind. Here's the prophet of mercy. Now listen to this. I will have, this is Messiah speaking. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I, I am not called to, I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Matthew 9, 13. Messiah, in a sense, is the prophet of mercy. The, the, the prophet that brought mercy. Here's a quote from the Halo movie or video game, Prophet of Mercy. Their slander offends all who walk the path. Halo, its divine wind will rush through the stars, propelling all who are worthy along the path to salvation. Can you see how they're like taking Bible scriptures, twisting it, and what they're doing is they're making this alien covenant race that's coming to take over the earth look like a freak show. The Prophet of Truth, quote, Be glad. A reward for all your toil and all your sacrifices in the year at hand. Who would doubt the prophets? What have they foretold that has not come to pass? These are all quotes from Halo, from the prophets here. Whoever is gripped by fear, take heed. I am the prophet of truth, and I am not afraid. Noble mercy is here at my side. His wise counsel is ever in my ears. They're literally mocking the scriptures, brothers and sisters. It's right here. So look, there's the enemy. Go get him. So in Halo, you got this, of course, the circular ring thing. There's actually so many more that we can keep going for hours. Just like the news articles with the alien agenda. There's so many more things in movies and, and video games that I, I really could have made this like a four or five hour documentary type film. But uh, that's not that's not what I wanted to do here. I want to give you some snippets. So while there are a few movies that depict other shapes in relation to aliens, as we at least their ships or homes or cities, whatever, as we mentioned before, the circle is the dominant one. Why the circle? Why is Hollywood training the world to be afraid of, reject, and ultimately fight against this circular spaceship city object coming down from the sky? Why has Satan been forcing this into the minds of the masses? Is it really just about entertainment and money? We believe this agenda is way more sinister, and we've been talking about it along the way. So, again, thinking about this war that's coming. Here's, a, here's Psalm 2. Why are the nations restless and the people plotting in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers conspire against Yahweh the Father and against his anointed, the Son, saying, let us tear their shackles apart and throw their ropes away from us. So, let's cast them away from us. We don't want the Most High and, and the Son is what they're saying. He who sits in the heaven laughs. Yahweh scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion. Zion is really New Jerusalem, the kingdom at this point. My holy mountain. I will announce the decree of Yahweh. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have fathered you. Ask it of me, and I will certainly give the nations as your inheritance, and the ends of the earth as your possession. You, so Messiah, shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Psalm 2, 1 through 9. So again, when Messiah comes with his kingdom, he's going to shatter the nations. And that's what these alien movies depict, is this outside force coming in. Think of every alien invasion movie. Though the aliens bring massive destruction... The nations band together and defeat the enemy. Satan has brainwashed the masses thinking they could defeat a much more advanced foe, Messiah. As we just read in Psalm 2, they will make these plans in vain. They will be crushed. Make sure you're not on the wrong side of this war. Hopefully by now, we're not done, but hopefully by now you're able to see a deliberate agenda is being circulated to the world. There is still so much more to cover. I want to answer the question of why the circle? Why has the media portrayed this circle of, of this circle thing coming down out of the, out of the earth?
or out of, out of the sky, heavens. The shape of New Jerusalem I want to talk about. The book of Enoch and how it ties in. The shape of heaven and earth and why it's important. The good versus the bad aliens, demons, and fallen angels. So like you know, like in Transformers, those of you who watch it, you have the good Transformers, you have the bad Transformers. And of course, like in, in like... Um, the Avengers series, you have these good superheroes and the bad superheroes. So this is the good versus the bad aliens. And I do believe there's going to be two sets of aliens that come. You're going to have the bad aliens that, well, we'll talk more about it here in a sec. Uh, fake alien invasion. And there's so much more. Uh, until then, I ask, so we're going to have to have a part two for this, but stay with me really quickly. This is why I really want to tell you, because this is the real agenda at hand. Uh, until part two, I ask, how much time are you spending in his word getting to know him? How much time are you spending watching TV and movies and video games, which you can clearly see have these sinister uh, agendas to them, even if it's not about these alien things. Satan has agenda behind entertainment, and it's to brainwash you and to, to take your mind away from the Most High. The truth is, this life is but a blink of an eye compared to eternity. Have you truly given your life to him? Have you accepted the testimony of his son dying on the cross? Have you been baptized? Are you walking as he walked, obedient to the commandments, the law, the Torah that we mentioned earlier? And I know most of you have been taught that the law is done away with or that it's bad or it's just for the Jews and that you're a Gentile so you don't have to do these things. I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, you've been lied to on so many fronts. Almost everything in this world is lies. And that's one of the biggest ones that we don't have to keep his commandments. So are you walking in obedience to the commandments or are you living for yourself in sin like the world does? If you're unsure whether or not your relationship with him is on the right track or not, I would love to recommend this playlist to you that may help you along the way. Seeking him with all your heart is worth more than anything on this earth. See you in part two, brothers and sisters. Here is the link for it. And I pray that you take a look at it if you think your relationship needs strengthening or you need to learn a little bit more about the Most High and want to be on the right side of things when it goes down. So with that, blessings to you. Shalom. And may the Most High guide you uh, through His Son in belief and through truth and that you seek Him out with all of your heart, soul, and mind. Time, I believe, is running short and it's worth all of your effort. Blessings in Yahushua's name. Shalom. How are aliens and the biblical end times connected with each other? Honestly, more than they want you to know. The topic of extraterrestrials typically surfaces thoughts of flying saucers, little green men, invasions, abductions, and much more. Over the past 121 years, Hollywood has been busy at work forming the minds of the masses through media. Little did we know, they are preparing the world to reject and fight against our Messiah when he returns. Seem far-fetched? Possibly. However, have you ever wondered how the beast is able to get the whole world to fight the Messiah? It's time to expose the dark agenda at hand and bring to light the truth. Hey, welcome back, brothers and sisters. Adam here with the Parable of the Vineyard. And today, it's time for part two of this study about the alien agenda and what the world is trying to convince the people of is basically to fight the Messiah at his second coming. Now, if you saw part one, I think we pretty well established that. Even if you haven't watched it, hey, we welcome you here. I would recommend watching that, but let's get right into it. And let's go to the second part of this series. So the alien agenda in the Bible, part two. So in part one of this study, we discussed how Satan, Hollywood, and the world as a whole are blinding the masses in relation to the second coming of Messiah. As we discussed, Satan's job is to control the narrative. So how things play out. So that when things begin to transpire, People won't be turning to the scriptures for answers. No, they will look to their earthly kings for direction as the movies and media have instructed them to. So long story short, when things start, start happening, it's, just, it's much like climate change. When they, they're, they're pushing climate change, climate change so that when all the things that are talked about in the book of Revelation about the drought and the extreme sun and burning people, all these kind of things, 
people are going to be like, oh, this is that climate change they've been, they've been telling me about. They're not going to turn to their Bible for answers, or at least that's what they want to do. But of course, the Spirit of the Most High can penetrate through any of these deceptions, and that's what this video is about. So, um, in short, we have showed you very plainly that Satan, the beast, and all the nations will unite as one to attempt to, to defeat this common enemy. That's what the scriptures say will happen, and this is what they portray in the movies. However, we know who really wins the, wins the war. So real quick, just want to let you know, everything we're covering today is in article form. I'll make sure to leave a link for the article in the description box below the, uh, the video, as well as a pinned comment in the comment section. So let's continue. So these shall make war with the Lamb. This is talking about, the, about Satan, the beast, the dragon. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is master of masters and king of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Revelation 17, 14. And I don't know about you, uh, but I want to be one of the ones that are called, chosen, and faithful. And it says that they're with him, Messiah. So something to talk about at the end. That was Revelation 17, 14. In part two, our mission is to answer the questions presented in part one, which is, the good versus bad aliens. This is demons and fallen angels. And this is a very important one because uh, I've been speaking with a lot of you and a lot of you are wondering like, well, what if Satan appears first as this uh, alien um, uh, takeover or whatnot? And we'll definitely cover that because that's definitely a possibility. Why Hollywood repeatedly depicts the circle? Like why is it always this mothership circle city thing coming down as a big circle? We're going to talk about the shape of New Jerusalem, which is the coming kingdom of Messiah. We're going to be talking about the book of Enoch and how it ties in. We're going to talk about fake alien invasions, Planet X or Nibiru, uh, the shape of heaven and earth and why it's important. We're going to be talking about Warner Von Braun and the firmament. But most importantly, we're going to be talking about the true lasting wisdom. So with that, let's begin with reminding ourselves how of how blatant Hollywood's mockery of our Elohim. If you're not familiar, Elohim is the Hebrew word for God as we know it. So uh, a good friend of mine, Aaron, shared this with me, uh, one of my neighbors. He said, Adam, you, you didn't mention X-Men Apocalypse. And I'm like, what's X-Men Apocalypse? So he showed it to me. And the um, the villain, the main villain in this movie, Apocalypse, or uh, born in Sabah Nur, was an immensely powerful and ancient mutant. He was believed to be the very first mutant and the ancestor of all uh, mutant kind, having survived for, for several millennia. So I, I want to share a couple things with you. Uh, if you can see over here on the side, his aliases or other names are the first one. What does Messiah say? I am the first and the last. Apocalypse. What is Messiah bringing? The apocalypse. Elohim. This is the Hebrew word for God. Shen, which is really close to Shem, which is one of the Hebrew names, Ra, Krishna, Yahweh. Now, if you're with us in part one, you probably heard how I understand, or some of us understand the, the father's name is Yahuwah. Some say Yahuwah, some say Yahweh, uh, some say Yahuwah, many different terms. But it's interesting that this character is known as Yahweh. Uh, and so obviously this is a mockery uh, of our Elohim. And the, some of the quotes he says in this movie uh, watch, listen to this. Elohim, Shem, Ra. I have been called many names over many lifetimes. I am born of death. I was there to spark and fan the flame of man's awakening. Well, who did that? To spin the wheel of civilization. And when the forest would grow rank and needed clearing for new growth, I was there to set it ablaze. This is a quote from this apocalypse character. Weapons, superpowers, the weak have taken the earth. For this, I was betrayed. False gods, idols, no more. I have returned. Doesn't this sound like some of the things that Messiah is doing? He was betrayed, and he and he and he detests, of course, false gods, idols, and he's returning. So this is how Hollywood paints the picture, or tries to twist scriptures and paint the picture of our Messiah and our Heavenly Father of being the enemy. Listen to this. This is very interesting. You can fire your arrows from the Tower of Babel. But you can never strike God. Apocalypse. And you know, this is all from X-Men Apocalypse 2018. But this is, of, this is of real interest right here. Firing the arrows from the Tower of Babel is so specific and found in one place only. A book not included in the Bible, yet it was mentioned twice in Joshua 10.13 and 2 Samuel 1.18. I'll show you real quickly. It says... Um, 
is it not written in the book of Jasher? And then right here, is it written in the book of Jasher? So there's a book called the book of Yashar or Jasher that actually talks about this very thing right here. Watch this. This is about the Tower of Babel. And the building of the Tower of Babel was unto them a transgression and a sin. And they began to build it. And whilst they were building against Yahweh Elohim of heaven, they imagined in their hearts to war against him and to ascend into heaven. And all these people and all the families divided themselves into three parts. The first said, we will ascend into heaven and fight against him. The second said, we will ascend to heaven and place our own gods there and serve them. And listen to this. The third part said, we will ascend to heaven and smite him with bows and spears. And Elohim knew all their works and all their evil thoughts. And he saw the city and the tower which they were building. And Yahuwah knew their thoughts. And it came to pass when they were building, listen to this, they cast their arrows towards the heavens. And all the arrows fell upon them filled with blood. And when they saw them, they said to each other, surely we have slain all those that are in heaven. For this was from Yahuwah, in order to cause them to err, and in order to destroy them from off the face of the earth. And that was Jasher 9, 26 through 27, and 29 through 30. So, how specific is this? You can fire your arrows from the Tower of Babel, but you can never strike God. Obviously, taking a jab at this passage that we just read here, there's only one place this is found. The enemy knows scripture. All right, so let's get to the real aliens. The real aliens are Satan, the fallen angels, and demons. An ancient struggle between two Cybertronian races, the heroic Autobots and the evil Decepticons come to Earth to destroy it. In several movie series, there exists a battle, an ancient battle, between two types of aliens or superheroes or superhumans, a good versus evil. Examples of this dynamic is found in movies such as the Transformers series, the Marvel saga, the TV show The Colony, and many others. What's typically presented is this. The good aliens, which are actually the evil ones, I know it's confusing, but listen, Satan likes to turn everything upside down. His job is to turn what's good into evil and what's evil into good. So in these movies, naturally, they would portray the good people as the bad people. So again, I'm a little confusing. So what's typically presented in this is this, the good aliens, which are actually the evil ones, come to earth first, present themselves as the protectors of humanity, seeking to save them from the coming enemy who is typically far superior in power. As we mentioned in part one, we do see heaven coming to earth in Revelation chapter 12, two kingdoms or two rivals simultaneously. And that's what you see in these movies. And the great dragon was cast out, that serpent, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our Elohim and the power of his Messiah for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our Elohim day and night. Revelation 12, 9 through 10. So what we see here is when Satan is thrown down to the earth, at that time, now comes salvation and the kingdom comes. Now, I understand that we've all been taught something different. However, the text says what it says. When Satan is finally cast out at that time, the kingdom of Messiah comes down. It's as if all of heaven, the heavenly realm, comes down to earth simultaneously. We see something very similar in Isaiah 14. For Yahweh will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel and set them on their own land. And the strangers shall be joined with them and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. And it shall come to pass in that day. Yahweh shall give you rest from your sorrow and from your fear and from the hard bondage wherein you were made to serve, and that you shall take up this proverb against the king of Babylon, which I believe this is a name for Satan in this context, and say, How has the oppressor ceased? The golden city is ceased. And this is Isaiah 14, 1 and 3 through 4. So at the beginning of Isaiah 14, we see the time that Yahuwah gathers his people into their own land. I believe this is the final regathering, not what happened in 1948, but the final regathering of all the tribes of all of Yah's people. Some would say the physical land of Israel. However, I do believe this is referencing New Jerusalem, in my opinion, of course, Yahuwah's everlasting tabernacle. Now, a few verses later, we see this in, in Isaiah 14. How are you fallen from heaven, O Hallel? So I think Lucifer may be a bad translation. So this is Satan's name, Hallel. 
How are you fallen from heaven, O Hallel, son of the howling morning? How are you cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of Elohim. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you will be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see you shall narrowly look upon you and consider you, saying, Is this the one that made the earth to tremble and did shake the kingdoms? Isaiah 14, 12 through 16. So the point is, is we can see that this event, both kingdoms coming to earth, may in fact happen around the same time. However, it is possible that there is a short time period between Satan's fall and the arrival of the kingdom. This is why we need to understand that the first arrival of aliens could be Satan and his crew. We must stay vigilant. 2 Corinthians 11, 14-15, Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no wonder that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. In the end, they will get the punishment their wicked deeds deserve. So Satan's, uh, you know, he's a highly intelligent being, okay? Obviously not intelligent enough to not transgress the Most High, but he has a higher intelligence source than us people right now. So if he were to deceive the people, do you think he would come down like all in red with horns and a big tail and a pitchfork? Or do you think he might come down as maybe even as the Messiah? Because remember, he's the lawless one, right? He's the false version of our Messiah. With at least the, you know, the Antichrist is. So... The point is, if he comes down with his people, with his ministers, they're not going to look like, you know, horrific beings. They're going to come down and be like, we're here. We want to protect you from what's coming. The colony, uh, in the wake of a mysterious alien invasion, a family fights to stay together in a new world order. This is actually probably one of the last things I ever watched uh, in TV series. Um, And what was interesting about this is this played into the exact narrative that I'm telling you about. Um, The quote unquote good aliens came first. However, they were the evil ones. They actually enslaved everyone, built up big walls, and kept everybody in small colonies. Uh, They worked them to the bone. Um, They did restore order, if you will. Uh, But the whole thing is they, they used human labor to build up this defense against the big bad aliens that are coming that have far superior technology. So the aliens had to kind of unite with the people and to put up this this resistance against uh, these big bad guys that are coming to destroy the earth. And what's interesting is when those um, superior aliens actually came, they were definitely like spiritual uh, beings. Uh, They had, you know, telekinesis. They could read minds. Uh, It was just anyways. So... This is an appropriate time to mention Project Bluebeam, which there's a link here if you want to learn more. I'm not going to get too far into this, but to make the situation even more complex, it is possible the world governments could fake a second coming and or staged invasion to instill fear and make totalitarian changes. Listen, at the end of the day, I don't have all the answers. I don't ever claim to, but I do want to put all possible scenarios out there for Yahuwah's people to be aware of so that we know there's different scenarios. So, you know, the, the Hollywood is putting their propaganda out to condition people for when things happen so they know how to react. In in a completely opposite manner, I will, myself and I'm sure many others are trying to warn Yas people of these different scenarios that can come down. So furthermore, if you haven't seen the understanding that we have at this time about the Antichrist, the video below may bless you. So there will be a link here in the um, the article if you want to check it out. So the only true aliens are the evil spirits that departed from the bodies of the giants from Genesis 6. And now, the giants who are produced from the spirits of flesh shall be called evil spirits upon the earth, and on the earth shall be their dwelling. So this is talking about when the giants died, they had a spirit in them, and these spirits are called the evil spirits. Evil spirits have proceeded from their bodies because they are born from men and from the holy watchers is their beginning and primal origin. They shall be called evil spirits on earth, and evil spirits shall they be called. As for the spirits of heaven, in heaven shall be their dwelling. But as for the spirits of the earth, which were born upon the earth, on the earth shall be their dwelling. And the spirits of the giants, the departed spirits, that is, these are the evil demons, afflict, oppress, destroy, attack, do battle, work destruction on the earth, and cause trouble. They take no food, 
but nevertheless they hunger and thirst and cause offenses. And these spirits shall rise up against the children of men and against the women because they have proceeded from them. This is First Enoch 15, 8 through 11. So now, let's talk about the shape of New Jerusalem, the coming kingdom, that as we read in part one, in two Esdras, when Messiah comes, he brings his reward with him. He brings this kingdom that's cut without hands. So this is, we're going to answer why the circle. So now I'd like to begin to answer why the circle we asked frequently in part one. We went through all these different movies, and it's like almost, I'd say 90% of them are this big circle, alien mothership city thing that comes down to take over the world. So I do believe it has everything to do with the coming kingdom appearing as the threat. If you search New Jerusalem, you'll likely have results like this. Which, I don't know about that one. That one looks like Disneyland, New Jerusalem. Obviously, that ain't it. So at this point, regardless of where you are in your walk, you probably realize that most of what has been taught is false. Likewise, I do believe that the true shape of New Jerusalem may have been veiled over the centuries. So why this common cube shape? It's from here, from this verse. And the city lies four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs, 1,500 miles. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. So the length is 1,500 miles, the width is 1,500 miles, and the height is 1,500 miles. So that's Revelation 21:16. So it seems like there's no further discussion needed. Four square, a cube. And it may indeed be, New Jerusalem may indeed come down as a, as a cube. Even though Hollywood portrays the circle, it may in fact come down as a big cube or pyramid as most of us have imagined. However, I'd like to put forth a few things just to consider. The Greek word for four square is comprised of two words, tetra or tesaris and gonos, gonia. The word formed together is tetragonos. Tetra is four, gonos is corners. So four corners. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Revelation 7.1. So the same use of tetra or tesaris and gonos, gonia, from four square in Revelation 21. So I ask you, is the earth squared, cubed, or is it circular? And the reason I'm bringing this up is because right here, they have four angels standing on the four corners of the earth. So is the earth a cube, and are the angels standing on the four corners of it? So again, the question, is earth squared, cubed, or circular? It is he that sits upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretches out the heavens as a curtain, and spreads them out as a tent to dwell in. Isaiah 40, 22. And he said to me, at the beginning of the circle of the earth, 2 Esdras 6, 1, if you're not familiar with 2 Esdras, it was part of the Apocrypha and the 1611 KJV and many other prominent Bibles. It was considered scripture for a long time. But anyways, furthermore, I'd like to share a few passages from the book of Enoch. If you're unfamiliar with it, here are a few short videos introducing it and why I believe it's scripture. That's the position I'm coming from. I believe First Enoch is scripture. In short, Jude quoted it verbatim. He quoted Enoch verbatim. Peter taught from it in Second Peter. And Messiah rebuked the Sadducees for not knowing it. This is a link right here. And this short video series, I think one, one, of, one of them is, the first one's nine minutes. I think the second two are both 20 minutes. So it's a very short series about introducing you to Enoch if you're not familiar. So, we're talking about the circle. First, Enoch and the circle. And first, there goes forth the great luminary, named the sun, and his circumference is like the circumference of heaven. And he is quite filled with illuminating heat and fire. Enoch 72.4. So, wait, what? Did you catch that? I don't know how many times I've read this passage, but it seemed to have jumped out at me recently. As he rises, so he sets and decreases not, and he rests not, but runs day and night, and his light, the sun, is sevenfold brighter than that of the moon. But as regards to size, they are both equal. Now, I'll tell you, most of you who grew up in the um, going to school, public school or even private school, you learned that the sun is 400 times larger than the moon, but it's so many million miles more further away, so they just happen to appear the equal size. Um, I believe, again, the scripture is, says what it says, and I believe, I believe my eyes, and I believe that when you look at the sun and you look at the moon, they're of equal size. So, if you didn't pick up what Enoch was putting down, here it is again, but for the moon. And after this law, I saw another law dealing with the lesser luminary, which is called the moon. And her circumference is like the circumference of heaven. Enoch 73, 1 through 2. So, the point is, is heaven has a circumference. What's a circumference? Most of you should remember. 
but a circumference is the perimeter of a circle. So these are the two great luminaries. Their circumference is like the circumference of the heaven, and the size of the circumference is both alike. I understand this may defy what most of us were taught in school, but have you not realized that we've been lied to on so many fronts? O oh, Yahuwah, my strength and my fortress, and my refuge in the day of affliction, the nation shall come unto you from the ends of the earth and shall say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanity, and things wherein there is no profit. Jeremiah 16, 19. We've inherited lies, brothers and sisters. The sun and the moon are the same size. The point is, if heaven has a circumference, then it is a circle. Why would it be any different? If the earth is a circle, wouldn't heaven be a circle? Would that make would that make sense in relation to the earth? We'll come back to this concept momentarily. So let's now talk about the circle of the earth. Flat or globe? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in. Isaiah 40, 22. Ask yourself, what does a tent look like? We're going to look at up ancient tent. So what does a tent look like? What would, if, if this was written, uh, Isaiah was written, let's call it 2,700 years ago, what would they know a tent looks like? Would it be a, like a ball, like a globe? Or would, this is what a tent looks like, right? So this is what he says. I don't know about you. I trust the word. I don't trust NASA. I don't trust uh, any, any of these agencies. And when he says that the circle of the earth and that he stretches out the heaven like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in, I believe it. It is he who searches the deep and its treasures, who has measured the sea and its contents, who has enclosed the sea in the midst of the waters, and by his word has suspended the earth over the water. Not over mantle and crust and core and magma and liquid hot magma. Who has spread out the heaven like an arch and founded it upon the waters. To Ezra 16, 57 through 59. So whether you believe the earth is geocentric, what people reference as flat, I don't, I don't use the term flat earth. I use geocentric earth. So whether you believe it's geocentric or a globe, his creation is circular. Why would we think heaven would be any different, especially considering all the heavenly bodies are circular? Sun, moon, stars, etc. If Yahuwah were to look down from heaven and see a globe, it would be a circle. If he looked down upon a geocentric earth, it would be a circle. This is what he'd look down and see. This is the geocentric earth. And this is what it means to enclose the waters. There's boundaries where it stops moving, stops going. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. Listen to this. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, Proverbs 8, 27. Setting a compass upon the face of the depth. This is what a geocentric earth looks like. Waters above, waters below. Genesis 1 says that he made the firmament and he separated the waters above the firmament from the waters below the firmament. So either, either um, science has it right, and NASA, that it's an empty space of vacuum and nothingness, or you believe your Bible, which says the waters above and the waters below. Praise him, you heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heaven. Psalm 148.4. There's no room for this verse with the, the model that science teaches us currently. And Elohim said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And Elohim made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so, Genesis 1, 6 through 7, the first page of your Bibles. Firmament, it's an extended surface, solid, expanse, firmament, expanse, flat as base with support. A firmament, the vault of heaven supporting the waters above considered by Hebrews as solid and supporting the waters above. Can you with him spread out the skies, which is strong and as a molten looking glass? Job 37, 18. What does that mean, right? So this is the Hebrew concept. You've got the firmament, which it says it has foundations and pillars. And you have the earth, the great deep. This is what, this is what the ancients knew. So I ask you, was Moses given faulty information regarding creation? Or have we been lied to all of our lives? So you have to ask yourself, again, there's no room for waters above the firmament and waters below the firmament in the current globe model that we're taught today. So 
was, again, I ask you, was Moses given faulty information when he wrote Genesis? Did he just not know? Was he just not intelligent enough? Or have we been lied to all of our lives? The truth is, once you realize we are not some haphazard being created by stardust and nothingness, spinning through infinite space at breakneck speeds, you start to realize the truth of Yahweh's word. You begin to trust him with all your heart, soul, and mind. When you grasp that his word is trustworthy, you can take it literally. Bless Yahweh, O my soul. O Yahweh, my Elohim, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty, who cover your, covers yourself with light as with a garment, who has stretched out the heavens like a tent. There it is again. Who has laid the beams of your chambers on the waters, who makes the clouds your chariot, who rides on the wings of the wind, who makes the winds your messengers, fire and flame your ministers. You did set the earth on its foundations so that it should never be moved. Foundations foundations of the earth. The truth is no heliocentric model, no aliens. There is no distant planet that some alien force is going to come through. The whole thing is nonsense. And I believe this is why the Most High allowed us to see this truth of a earth that he created, firm on foundations that does not move, except for earthquakes, of course. And it has a dome firmament. Nothing goes in, nothing goes out. Look up Operation Paperclip. No, Operation Fishbowl on YouTube. I don't know if they've hit it by now, but it's pretty interesting. They sent up a bunch of uh, nukes to, to blow up the firmament and they couldn't touch it. But so the truth is no heliocentric model, no aliens. A geocentric earth with a dome firmament, no aliens. Only Yahweh's kingdom or the devil's. If you've never looked into biblical cosmology, which... If you think I'm just absolutely crazy, I understand. I would encourage you to seek it out. As Satan has deceived the whole world, here's a short playlist that may bless you. It's just four videos. Here's a playlist if you're like, gosh, I don't know, Adam, I don't know what you're talking about here, but I'll keep watching this video, but this is so dumb. Everybody knows that the earth is a globe and we've proved it and all that. Please, I would, I would encourage you to watch it. It is important. People say it's not. It is. The globe deception is at the center of this whole agenda. Think about it. If the firmament is solid, there is no going in or out until the, revela until the time of Revelation 12, 7 through 9, when the firmament rolls back like a scroll and Satan is thrown down. Here's a couple of videos. Uh, I'm, I, was a little, uh, I was a little saddened. Um, these videos were a lot easier to find uh, five, six years ago when I was researching this, but now they seem to have hidden a lot of these. Um... So this is what real stars look like with these amazing cameras that are available, the P9, the Nikon P900, the Nikon P1000. They're not some distant planet. They're literally lights. So you zoom out, zoom in. This is what they actually look like. So these are real stars, not NASA cartoons. So look, look what these stars actually look like. And... And it's almost some of them, they're so interesting that it looks like they're underwater. Like when you've ever seen something underwater and it's like the water's moving and this is what these look like. Some of the really good ones out there I think have been hidden. But do your own research. It's fascinating to see what these stars actually look like. This is Polaris, by the way, the North Star. And this is what it actually looks like. It's beautiful. Look, see, look at, look at that right there. That looks like a light that has water beneath it I don't know I just find this amazing this is uh, uh, serious look look at this thing this is not what NASA has been telling us look see how it looks like it's underwater just amazing These are real stars, brothers and sisters. Look at that. Look at that. And you zoom out and look, it's just a ball of light. And you're like, oh yeah. That is what is amazing about the cameras in these days. Anyways, uh, there's one more. There's, there's a bunch out there. Look at that. See how it looks like it's underwater? This is not what they've been teaching us. Look at this. That's what these things look like. Anyways, there's so many more. 
amazing, amazing to go research it for yourself. So anyways, back to the circle. The point is heaven and earth are both circles. Why would New Jerusalem be a cube or a pyramid? Round about the throne, there were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats, I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Revelation 4.4. 4. Here's the Greek word uh, used for roundabout. Uh, a roundabout from all sides, all around, uh, from the circle round. So his throne room is circular. What about the tabernacle in the wilderness? Isn't that a rectangle sh uh, shape like the shoebox, right? This is what we all know. When you search the tabernacle in the wilderness, you'll almost always come up with this shoebox shape. Is that the truth? Perhaps, maybe. I don't have all the answers. However, after finding the research done by an engineer and brother in the faith by the name of Andrew Hoy, I believe it's highly possible that it may have been a dome octagonal tent as represented here. As many of us are digging into the word and realizing lies have been perpetrated regarding the truth of our walk of faith and obedience, Andrew took it further. I'll leave you links for all his material if you decide to look into it further. So basically, he looked at the building of the tabernacle, and he's he was, as an engineer, so he's like, you know what? This can actually work. The same materials can work as an octagonal dome rather than the shoebox. So uh, I'm not an expert on this. I'll just leave you uh, his source material so that you can look it up for yourself. Uh, here's, uh, again, on this article, you'll have uh, links for his website, his YouTube uh, page. And this is a, a link for a video. This is an interview with Rob Ski, but this is how I found Andrew right here. So if the tabernacle was a circular dome, which is very possible, um, Satan would have many reasons to cover it up, much like he does with the very earth we live on. So let's get to New Jerusalem dimensions earlier. We read, right? And the city lies four square, and its length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs, 1,500 miles. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. So here's just an example of where New Jerusalem could set down. This is roughly the borders that were given to Abraham in Genesis 15 of your descendants will live here forever. So anyways, this would, be, this would represent 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. Easy, squared, right? The book of Revelation tells us New Jerusalem measures 1,500 miles for its length and height and width. The image above makes sense and works. So does this. If you put a circle around it, it would still be 1,500 miles wide and 1,500 miles long. What about height? So this could, this is obviously not a um, to scale representation, but let's say this could be 1,500 miles tall. That makes sense. Well, so could that. If it was like a dome coming down, you could also have 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. So the arch or dome is one of the strongest shapes in arch architecture. It's, it is debated uh, that either the triangular or the circular shape is king. Who has enclosed the sea in the midst of the waters and by his word has suspended the earth over the water. Who has spread out the heaven like an arch and founded upon the waters. So here's the arch strength in action. So again, who has spread out the heaven like an arch and found it upon the waters. How about the rainbow? Why does the rainbow have that shape? I believe it's because the firmaments, the heavens, the layers of heaven. I think it is highly possible that New, that New Jerusalem will come down as a circular dome city. If this is the case, this is why I believe the media is pitching the evil circle city mothership agenda. Listen to this. This is just, uh, I think, last week. Pentagon and Harvard UFO experts, alien motherships could be flying through our solar system. Yeah. For the wisdom, this world is foolishness with Elohim. So all these scholars and doctorates and master's degrees and all this stuff is foolishness with Elohim. When it comes to, and I'm not mocking all... Uh, areas of study. Um, what I am mocking, not mocking, I don't want to mock. What I am talking about or referencing with this is when it comes to well, how they how they teach about the solar system and heliocentrism and that we're flying like a ball through or fly, a ball, flying ball uh, going at 66,000 miles uh, an hour, spinning at 1,000 miles an hour, which makes no sense. But this is all nonsense right here. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with Elohim. For it is written, he takes the wise and their own craftiness. So they're gonna, he's going to use all this nonsense against them when all this goes down. Remember this big old circular dome thing. 
After all, I think, or after, I'm sorry, after all, think about the typical narrative in these movies. Independence Day is a perfect example. A huge alien mothership comes to destroy the world and take it over. The people of the Earth put down their differences and unite to destroy the common enemy. We read this last time, or last week, with a survival guide for an alien invasion. It would be every country versus the aliens. It would be logical in the face of an extraterrestrial threat for all, unas- all nations to unite. Our Messiah will be coming down with his city out of heaven to take over the earth as it is, is, is right. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. It's his. He can do with it as he pleases. Exodus 19.5 The earth is Yahweh's, and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Psalm 24.1 he will be coming with fire and vengeance as it is the righteous judgment of Yahweh our Father. It's Satan's job to spin the story to deceive the nations into fighting against him, thinking he's a villain or an alien threat. A voice of noise from the city, a voice from the temple, a voice of Yahweh that renders recompense or repayment to his enemies. Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Shall I bring to the birth and not cause to bring forth, says Yahuwah? Shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb, says your Elohim? Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad with her, all you that love her. Rejoice for joy with her, all you that mourn for her, that you may suck and be satisfied with the breasts of her consolations, that you may milk out and be delighted with the abundance of her glory. For thus says Yahweh, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the nations like a flowing stream. Then shall you suck, you shall be borne upon his sides, and be dandled upon her knees. As one whom his mother comforts, so will I comfort you, and you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. Again, I believe this is talking about heavenly Jerusalem, Zion. And when you see this, your heart shall rejoice, and your bones shall flourish like an herb. And the hand of Yahweh shall be known towards his servants, and his indignation towards his enemies. For behold, Yahweh will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebukes with flames of fire. Pause there real quickly just to look at this video. You know, when these ships came out of the skies, they're coming out with fire and vengeance. And so they're showing what's going to happen, but they're spinning the story. For by fire and by his sword will Yahweh plead with all flesh and the slain of Yahweh shall be many. They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst, eating swine's flesh, pig, and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together. If you're still eating pork right now, brothers and sisters, oh, I would encourage you to research that a little more. In our playlist section, we have biblical food um, discussions, and that may help you to understand that pork is not food and it's not to be eaten. Says Yahuwah, for I know their works and their thoughts. It shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. Isaiah 66, 6 through 18. So in this passage, we see the return of our king with his kingdom, New Jerusalem. At the same time, he miraculously gathers his people to his kingdom. This will be visible to all the nations and will be bigger than the first Exodus event. See Jeremiah 16, 14 through 15 and 23, 7 through 8. So to the world, this would provoke thoughts of an alien abduction. Just my thoughts. So if he gathers us to to himself, right? For Yahweh shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of Elohim, and the dead and Messiah shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet Yahweh in the air. And so shall we ever be with Yahweh. And that's, that would, that's what makes me think that perhaps New Jerusalem may just descend and stay up in the sky for some time. And that's why we see in these alien movies, the mothership just hovers over cities and just stays in the air. And they're like, hey, let's go get it. And so if this happens, not if, when this happens, it says that the dead's going to rise and go up to him. And the people, even the people that are alive are going to go up to him. What's that going to look like? Is this what? Hollywood's been portraying all these years with this this in the movies of course is bad you don't want this happening to you this is like an alien abduction like oh no look they're taking all those people your dead shall live their bodies shall rise oh dwellers in the dust awake and sing for joy for your dew is a dew of light and on the land of the shades you will let it fall come my people enter your into your chambers 
Where are these chambers? Remember, he's, Messiah says, in my father's house are many abodes, many living spaces. Enter into your chambers and shut your doors behind you and hide yourself for a little while until the wrath has passed. For behold, Yahuwah is coming forth out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. And the earth will disclose the blood shed upon her and will no more cover her slain. Isaiah 26, 19 through 21. So what he's saying here is when the resurrection happens and Paul confirms here, even the people who are alive at his coming will rise to meet him up in the clouds, up in the sky. Right? So it's going to look like this. And people are like, oh no, they're taking him. It's always portrayed as something that you wouldn't want to happen to you. This could be the real reason of Project Bluebeam, a counter narrative to their actual event. Perhaps they could stage a false version of the real event before it happens, making people, you know, lose lose hope or whatever. But the point is, when this actually happens, obviously it's not going to look like this. It's going to be a new Jerusalem. But this is going to be a good thing. As we just read in Isaiah 26, when this happens, our Heavenly Father's righteous judgment comes upon the earth. The Great Tribulation, this is the general theme of most alien movies. Think of War of the Worlds. When the aliens came, they had this loud, loud trumpet sound, right? Elohim has gone up with a shout, Yahuwah with the sound of a trumpet. What's that going to sound like? Ear piercing, maybe like the World of War, World of, War of Worlds, sorry. And remember in that, like the sound was so shrieking that people were fearful. At his coming, people are going to be fearful. People on the wrong side of things are going to be fearful. So for the master himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. You think that's going to be quiet? With the voice of the archangel, with the trump of Elohim, the trumpet of, of God? What's that going to sound like? Probably a lot more earth shattering than this sound. But this is again, just this is just how Hollywood brainwashes. This is Loki from the Avengers. He says, kneel before me. I said, kneel. Is this not simpler? Is this not your natural state? It is the unspoken truth of humanity that you crave subjugation. The bright lure of freedom diminishes your life's joy in a mad scramble for power, for identity. You were made to be ruled. In the end, you will always kneel. I believe this is a direct stab at our Messiah. I have sworn by myself the word is gone forth out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that er, unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Isaiah 45, 23. So they make our Father and Messiah seem like bloodthirsty, psychotic villains. Yet this is the earth they have made and given us ample time to repent and to turn to him through faith and obedience. I mean, think about it. They created this earth, the Son and the Father, the Father and the Son. They created this earth. They've given us rules to abide by. But yet the people hated him. And it's his right. Like, look at uh, Noah and the flood. Think about it. They didn't want to, they didn't want to um, obey the Father. They didn't want to obey. They were wicked. They, and, and the Most High took him away as he saw fit. That's his right. But the movies paint this as an as a unrighteous thing. So he's given us ample time to repent and turn to him through faith and obedience. And he said to me, you are not a better judge than Elohim or wiser than the Most High. Let many perish who are now living rather than the Torah, the law of Elohim, which is set before them, be disregarded. For Elohim strictly commanded those who came into the world when they came, what they should do to live and what they should observe to avoid punishment. Nevertheless, they were not obedient and spoke against him. They devised for themselves vain thoughts and proposed to themselves wicked frauds. They even declared that the Most High does not exist and they ignored his ways. They scorned his Torah, his law, and denied his covenants. They have been unfaithful to his statutes and have not performed his works. Therefore, Ezra, empty things are for the empty and full things are for the full. To Ezra, Ezra 7, 19 through 25. And even Messiah said, I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. John eight twenty four. His judgment is righteous and true. These movies attempt to get you to second guess his character. Who shall not fear you, O Yahweh, and glorify your name? For you only are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments are made manifest. Revelation 15, 4. So Hollywood makes the people who welcome this coming look like crazed fools. Like, yes. Like, if we saw New Jerusalem, wouldn't we be like, oh, yes, praise Yah. And people were like, what? This, this thing's coming to get us. So back to the circle. How long will you go about, O oh, you backsliding daughter? For Yahuwah has created a new thing in the earth. A woman shall encompass or compass a man. Jeremiah 31, 22. The word here, 
uh, to surround, circle. So the woman is New Jerusalem and she will compass, surround, circle his people. Uh, well, we read this already about Jerusalem. All right, Planet X, Nibiru. Planet X or Nibiru theory is about a distant planet that could one day come into our atmosphere and kill everything. Sound familiar? If New Jerusalem is a circular dome, what would it look like as it approached the Earth? Wouldn't it look like what they portray as another planet coming into our atmosphere? Here's a quick visual of what it might look like. Just a representation of this circle, just like a star when they when you saw them kind of zoom in. When you zoom in, it's like it, you know, just got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So if this bright shining thing came down, you know. Just coming closer and closer. People might say, oh, it's this planet X Nibiru thing. People are like, oh, look at that. What is that thing coming into our atmosphere, right? Let's go get them, boys. Right? This is maybe what Space Force is for. So perhaps this is also the reason Planet X or Nibiru is perpetrated. If a circle dome descends from above, it could be mistaken or passed off as another planet coming into our atmosphere. Or could it? I have that question. And what would it look like? Remember the Death Star we talked about in Part 1? Remember it has a throne room? It's called a Planet Killer. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, New Jerusalem, and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads, Revelation 14.1. So this is like the city coming down. When Messiah comes down with his city and kingdom, one of the first things we will see is the destruction of Mystery Babylon. Some people believe Mystery Babylon is America, some London, and others Rome. I believe these are all Babylon, but there's only one mother. This link right here is why we believe it's Jerusalem, the mother of all harlots. America is a harlot. Uh, Rome's a harlot. Um, all these different places. New York City's a harlot. They're all harlots, but there's a mother. There's an original mother. So honestly, regardless of where it is, it doesn't matter. Can you imagine what the world will think when a big city comes down from above and destroys an entire city, state, country, or territory? Remember Ronald Reagan's words? I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. So we read Revelation 14.1 earlier. Here we, keep, here we go. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, unto every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear Elohim and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Revelation 14, 6 through 8. So let me ask you a question. How would the people of the earth respond to an angel preaching the gospel? In part one, we showed you a video of a more biblically accurate depiction of what angels may actually look like. And I don't think people would be like, oh, mom, look, it's a cherubim. Or, oh, mom, it's a seraphim. They'd be like, what is that? Like aliens, you know. How, how about when they say, when the angels would say, worship him, worship him who made heaven and earth. Consider how Hollywood has taken scripture and made it look psychotic through these villains in these films. Would anyone listen? Also, through my current understanding and opinion, the fall of mystery Babylon would be the catalyst used to unite the whole world together. This is kind of interesting. Just a couple days ago, an astonishing picture of a complete rainbow that a pilot uh, Lloyd J. caught at 30,000 feet. Rainbows are actually complete circles, but we only see half of the arch from the earth. Now listen to this. I saw another mighty messenger come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. Why is it a rainbow? Long story short, uh, there's a video um, that we've we've been sharing in a lot of our studies that uh, all the gemstones that are used to build the foundation of New Jerusalem are called anisotropic gems. That when pure light is shown through them, they shine all the colors of the rainbow. So if Messiah were to come down with New Jerusalem above him and he is the light shining, well, wouldn't New Jerusalem shine the light of the rainbow coming down? So, and a rainbow was upon his head and his face was as it were the sun and his feet as pillars of fire and he had in his hand a little book open 
the book that only Messiah could open. And he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the messenger which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swore by him that lives forever and ever, who created the heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. Time's up. It's over. That was Revelation 10, 1 through 6. Just like in the uh, the movie, just like in the movie Independence Day, the aliens brought a message saying, time is up. They had a countdown. For I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. If I wet my glittering sword and take and my hand takes hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to my enemies and will reward them that hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh. And that with the blood of the slain and the blood of the ca- and of captives from the beginning of revenges upon the enemy. Rejoice, O nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance to his adversaries and will be merciful unto his land and to his people. Deuteronomy 32, 40 through 43. So the world and its people will mourn, but his children will rejoice. For more on this, please see this study, Mystery Babylon, the, ha- the mother of all harlots under the abominations. The same Mystery Babylon that's going to be destroyed and will be the catalyst, I believe, to unite the nations together. So let's talk about the fake alien invasion. Boy, this is this was this movie was terrible. Don't don't even don't watch it. And in those days, the angels shall return. That's what these are. These are the fallen angels coming to love humanity and guide them. And in those days, the angels shall return and hurl themselves to the east upon the Parthians and Medes. They shall stir up the kings so that a spirit of unrest shall come upon them. And they shall rouse them from their thrones that they may break forth as lions from their lairs and as hungry wolves among their flocks. And they shall go up and tread under the foot, underfoot the land of his elect ones. Enoch 56, 5 through 6. I believe these uh, these entities have actually already come back. And I think, I believe in the mid-1800s, that's where doctrine started wildly changing. That's when Zionism started. That's when these major war, uh, wars started. All to create the United Nations the, or the League of Nations, then United Nations, and to create the political state of Israel, setting everything up for the end times. I believe they're already here. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. First Peter 5. And let me also make a note that these uh, watchers returning, I believe, is different than the fall of Satan and his angels. I believe two different things. So remember, when Satan and his angels become visible on this earth, they will conspire against and speak blasphemy against Messiah and his kingdom, gathering the world together to fight against it. This is why they portray these superhumans wanting to assemble and fight the big bad guy coming in the sky. This is the beast. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against Elohim to blaspheme his name. And his tabernacle, Revelation 21 tells us the tabernacle of Elohim is New Jerusalem and them that dwell in heaven. So this is why I believe that there's probably a certain time that New Jerusalem will be hovering in the sky, impenetrable. But yet the beast is like, listen, this is our problem. We need to unite and get this guy. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Revelation 21, 2 through 3. So it's time to wake up, brothers and sisters, and it's time to help wake up your friends and your family. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Romans 11, or 13, 11 through 12. This is Werner von Braun. WikiLeaks put forth this document sharing the words of the late Werner von Braun, an ex-Nazi scientist that the U.S. recruited after World War II for his rocket program. Here's the transcript. This is WikiLeaks. I met the late Dr. Werner von Braun in early 74. At that time, von Braun was dying of cancer, but he assured me that he would live a few more years in order to tell me about the game that was being played. That game being the effort to weaponize space, hello Space Force, to control Earth from space and space itself. What was most interesting to me was a repetitive sentence that he said to me over and over again. That was the strategy that was being used to educate the public and decision makers and the scare tactics. The spin, no pun intended, being put 
on as justification for our advanced weapon systems was based on upon how we identify an enemy. The enemy at first, von Braun said, to justify our space-based weapon system, first the Russians are going to be considered the enemy. Interesting timing for this. Then terrorists would be identified. Then we were going to identify third world crazies. The next enemy was asteroids, and against asteroids, we're going to build space-based weapons. And the funniest one of all was against what he called aliens, extraterrestrials. That would be the final card. And over and over and over during the four years that I knew him and was giving his speeches for him, he would bring up that last card. And remember, Carol, the last card is the alien card. We're going to have to build space-based weapons against aliens, and all of it, he said, is a lie. Is there a possibility that powerful groups who control governments will use the extraterrestrial phenomenon to deceive the masses? Given everything we've seen with false flag terrorism so far, it certainly seems plausible. It's interesting to note that Dr. Von Braun made sure that Psalm 19.1 was engraved on his tombstone, signifying he knew about the truth of the firmament that our Creator made. Again, look up Operation Fishbowl, which I, I think uh, Von Braun was a part of, and Paperclip, where they tried to literally send rockets, uh, missiles into the firmament, and it didn't even touch it, scratch it. There's also a video, uh, I think is it SpaceX? Um, where the the rocket goes high enough and it actually hits the firmament and it like it goes dunk. Anyways, there are no aliens or other planets with extraterrestrials. It's only Elohim with his kingdom and Satan with his. Psalm nineteen one, the heavens declare the glory of Yahuwah and the firmament shows his handiwork. Von Braun knew about the firmament. So, the real w wisdom. We're wrapping up here. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the Torah of Yahuwah, Psalm 119.1. With the evidence put forth today, I pray you are able to see there is an evil agenda at hand. Topics like this and many others are certainly fascinating, but at the end of the day, what really matters is our faith and walk with our Creator. This is the real prepping for the last days. Do you seek the Father diligently? It's a question. Have you been washed of your sins by the blood of the Lamb, the Son of Elohim? Are you walking in his path? Do you even know what his path is? Will you be able to enter New Jerusalem regardless of its shape? If you want to seek him out further, please see this playlist below. So if you're like new, you're waking up, you're like, I know that the enemies lied to me and you know, I might, might, might have even grown up in church, but church doesn't feel like you know um, the truth is being spoken there and such and such. You're probably hearing from the Father. And if you want to learn more about how to walk this walk, and how to be ready, truly prepped. So people, you know, are always talking about, you know, uh, especially with right now what's going on in the banks, get your money out, do this and this and this, or, or, or prepping, you know, prepping. This is the real prepping. You want to be ready for his coming, this is the kind of prepping you need to make. Because listen, many are called, few are chosen. Remember at the beginning of this, we talked about those who are called and chosen and faithful, that they're with Messiah. Do you want to be part of that group? If you want to be one of the few who are called and chosen, it's time to repent of your sins, 1 John 3, 4. Believe in our Messiah and his offering for our lives. Dust off those scriptures and start reading, praying, and setting your life in accordance with his ways. This is the Torah, or the commandments. Otherwise, you may find yourself on the wrong side of all this when it goes down. There's a lot of people that are still in mainstream Christianity that would, would bark at this and say, oh, you're teaching a works-based salvation. I'm here to tell you that your faith Think of a plant. Think of a good sturdy plant, a good sturdy tree. Let's call you a tree. Your faith is the roots and your works are the fruits. That's the evidence that you're a true believer, a true convert, a true follower of Messiah. My little children, these things I write unto you, that you sin not. 1 John 3, 4 says that sin is transgression of the law. So he's writing to you, don't transgress the law, the Torah. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Yahusha, the Messiah. Again, that's just how we understand our Messiah's Hebrew name, the righteous. And he is the atonement for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Remember, I, or any of you remember that passage? In Actually, let's just read it real quick. Let's go to Matthew 7, and we'll go to verse 21 through 23, and it says this, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. So just because you call him Messiah, 
and, and your king and your Lord doesn't mean that you're getting into the, the kingdom of heaven. But he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. There is a passage that says the will of the Father is to believe in the Son. Now, have you shown your belief? Do you just say that you believe or do you actually show it that you believe? Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Unbelievers don't do that. And in your name have cast out devils. Unbelievers don't do that. And in your name have done many wonderful works. Unbelievers don't do that. Bill Gates doesn't give in the name of Messiah. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work in equity. So they're not going to enter the kingdom and you say, get away from me. And it says here, I never knew you. And this is what we're reading right now. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that says, I know him and keeps not his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in, in him. But whoso keeps his word in him verily is the love of Elohim perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that says he lives in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. So you ask yourself this question. How did Messiah walk? Did he walk disobedient or obedient? And now listen, just to clarify things, brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you had from the beginning if this was written in Hebrew, it would be since the Bereshit. Bereshit is the, the Hebrew word for the book of Genesis. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. 1 John 1, 1 through 7. And listen to this. With all the stuff that's coming upon the earth right now. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him, the Most High, and his Son, who which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew 10, 28. So fear none but him. Oh, this is what we read earlier, Matthew 7, so we can skip that. So don't let this be you. Don't let you, don't be the one that he says, away from me, I never knew you, you work over iniquity. Don't let this be you. It is time to be that generation of light that stands for his ways, worshiping the Father in spirit and in truth. Not how we want to do it, not how we were taught all of our lives, but how he commands it to be done in his life. In Matthew 15, the Messiah rebuked the Pharisees saying, uh, he quoted Isaiah, he said, you know, this people comes close to me with their mouth and with their lips they honor me, but their heart is far from me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So it's time to stand for his ways, how he commanded it to be done. If you're, you're still breathing, there's still blood on your veins, there's still time to make changes. If you would like some guidance along the path to him, please see this playlist. May Yahweh bless you along your journey. So... Shalom to you, brothers and sisters. I pray this was a blessing in some way, shape, or form. Shalom.